electricity. The basic idea is that magnets are moved past coils. So the moving magnetic field pushes on the electrons in the coils, making the electrons move and therefore creating a current. Number two, how does a coal-powered coal electric plant make electricity? Well, it's basically just a big way of boiling water. The steam goes through a fancy set of fans called a turbine and makes them spin. And that turns a generator. If at any time you cannot read my handwriting, you just ask, what is that? And I'll try to decipher it for you. So the energy transformations is, let's see here, we have the chemical energy in the coal between the atoms of carbon and whatnot. <coughs> that turns to thermal energy in the fire of burning coal. And yeah, there's other energies too. There's the light and maybe the sound of crackling, but thermal is the thing that's important. And that turns then into kinetic energy. The thermal energy heats up the water and then goes to make it steam, hot steam, and then the steam is rushing through the pipes. And then that kinetic energy turns to kinetic energy of the uh, turbine, which is the kinetic energy of the axle spinning, kinetic energy of the magnet spinning. And then finally we have the electric energy as the electrons are pushed through the wires. Pros and cons. Pros is that it's fully developed and it's cheap. No further technology is needed to get these things going. We got them. We've been having them for over 100 years now. Cheap. I don't know if they are the cheapest anymore. Natural gas prices have gone down tremendously, and I think they might be more affordable now than coal plants, but still, it's cheap. Cons? Okay, I'm sure that everybody knows about the air pollution. There are ways of cleaning up the smokestacks. They can spray water through the smoke and capture a lot of the particles and other such things. Static electricity can capture it, but it's still a, a concern. There are other pros and cons to all of these, but these are the biggest ones that come to my mind. How does a wind turbine make electricity? The action, the spinning blades. Turn a generator. So there's not many transformations here at all. We just have the kinetic energy of the wind turning to kinetic energy of the blades, the kinetic energy of the magnets spinning in the, in the generator, which turns into the electric energy of the electrons. Pros and cons. The pros, no pollution, at least in the operation. Making the silly things, of course, is going to make pollution, but once that's done, no more. The cons kills birds. But remember, cats kill more birds than windmills will. And also, it's unreliable. There's no place that has wind blowing all the time. So what do you do when the wind stops blowing? Hydroelectric action. Water rushes through turbines spins the generators. Water spins generators. By going through the special turbines, special set of fans. Transformation, just like the wind turbine, we have kinetic energy of the rushing water going into the spinning of the turbine, spinning of the axle, spinning of the magnets, all sorts of kinetic energy being passed along and then we end up with um, electric. Pros, no pollution. No fuel. I guess no fuel for these other things too. Cons, 
Um, let's see here. What should we say? It uh, floods a valley. Butterflies and squirrels can't live there no more. And there are few locations. You have to have a river in a valley. You can't build it on flat ground. You have to have rivers around, obviously. How does a nuclear power plant make electricity? Action. Um, the atoms in the fuel rods, atoms um, break and get hot. which boils water. And the steam turns a generator. So everything from getting the water hot to turning the generator is the exact same thing as a coal power plant. It's just a fancier way of boiling the water. Instead of a fire, you have these hot fuel rods. We're going to learn about how these atoms break in second semester. Energy transformations, then. We start off with nuclear energy. That's the stuff that holds the protons together in the nucleus. That turns into thermal energy. Uh, the hot water, hot steam, which turns into kinetic energy of the moving steam, moving turbine, moving axle, moving ac um, magnets. And then finally to electric. Pros and cons. Pros, it's fully developed. And it is profitable. Cons, of course, the waste. Oh, another thing about nuclear power is that it makes um, huge huge, um, um, how should I say this, amounts of electricity, huge amounts of electricity. One nuclear power plant could uh, power an entire state if it was a big nuclear power plant and if it was a small state. Let's see here. I can say the same thing about hydroelectric, huge electricity. I don't know how big the biggest uh, hydroelectric plant is, but it could, most likely, I'm going to just take a gander and say that it could power a city. Um, wind turbines and solar, not so much. Coal power plants, they can make huge amounts as well. Let's put huge here. Huge electricity. Okay, solar, solar, action. We have light makes electrons jump from one layer to another. What looks like a single solar panel to us is actually two layers with a tiny little gap in between. And the electrons can jump from one layer to the other if they get hit by the right amount of light. Energy transformation then is just simply from light energy into electric energy. This is the only way of getting electric energy without involving a generator of some sort. Pros and cons. Pros, no pollution, at least in the operation. Making the stuff is nasty, 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 but after that, it's just fine and dandy. And the cons, um, let's see here, it's unreliable. Only sunny days, no nights. Not even on a sunny night can you operate a solar panel. What type of energy is due to movement of large objects? That's kinetic. We're talking about macroscopic objects, a box, a car, a train. Bonds between atoms in a molecule. We refer to that as chemical energy. Temperature. Technically, it's thermal energy. Some people call it heat energy. Technically, that's not the right word. Apparently, um, there are some very, very picky people in the world who have posted articles on the web, and they say that heat is a verb. Heat is something that you do. You heat up some water. You never pass along heat. 
you don't have heat energy ah, for what it's worth glowing that means light energy height above the ground is gravitational some people prefer the term gravitational potential energy I try to drop the potential just out of uh, shortening up the world the amount of stretch or compression is elastic energy some people call it elastic potential energy and finally making noise is sound energy okay converting in your lab that I hope to do today maybe maybe not we'll see we need to convert both grams and centimeters to the more appropriate kilograms and meters remember that for all your story problems when you use a an equation you should be putting in kilograms for masses you should use meters for any x value velocities v should be in meters per second forces should be in plain old newtons so anyway let's convert this take a moment to convert numbers two and three try to do that on your own right now right now right now compare your answers to mine do the next two compare your answers to mine <laughs> what is the kinetic energy of a 10 kilogram bicycle moving at 5 meters per second for 20 seconds we're looking for kinetic energy. Think to yourself, what variable is equal to kinetic energy? There's a special one that's specifically just for kinetic energy. Can you find it in your list of equations? Should be a capital E with a little K, a subscript K for kinetic. The equation for that is one half mv squared. So putting in the numbers for the mass and the velocity, we have 1 half times 10 times the 5 squared. The 20 here is not used. It is extraneous. It can be omitted. So half of, let's see here, 5 squared is 25. 25 times 10 is 250. Half of 250 is 125. So 125 joules of energy. Number 7. What is the gravitational energy of a 200 kilogram jogger running at 3 meters per second over a bridge 2 meters above the creek? Think to yourself, what, equa uh, what variable is equal to the gravitational energy and what equation is it a part of? Look at your equation list, see if you can find it. You should be looking for an E with a subscript G for gravity. And the equation for that is mgh. So putting in the 200 for the mass, the 9.8 for g, and the h is the height, 2 meters. The 3 meters per second is irrelevant to gravitational energy. Multiplying 200, whoop, 200 times 9.8 times 2 equals 3920. Jewels. Questions so far? I'll pause here for a moment. All right, elastic energy. That is going to be E with a little tiny E, capital E for energy, little subscript small e for elastic, and the equation for that is one half kx squared. The k is a spring constant, that's three. The x is the amount of stretch which is point zero 0.01. So multiplying that all out, we have point 0.5 times 3 times point zero 0.01 squared equals point zero 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 one five. And that's joules. All energy can be measured in joules. 
Number nine, a 20 kilogram box falls off a shelf that's three meters above the ground. Use conservation of energy to find the velocity as it hits the ground. Conservation of energy is the idea that the initial energy, E sub i, is going to equal your final energy, E sub f. It doesn't matter what kind of energies you start off with at the beginning or end up with at the end, but the, the, the amounts are always going to be the same. So what we have to do in these kind of story problems is to figure out what is the energy at the beginning? What is the energy at the end, the final? Initially, it's high up on a shelf, so that's gravitational energy, mgh. That's on the left-hand side. And at the end, it is moving, it is plummeting to the ground, it has kinetic energy. It is one-half mv squared. I could cancel out the m's at this point, make my math a little bit easier, but I find that most students don't do that, so I'm not going to either. Let's put in the numbers. 20 kilograms for the mass, 9.8 for the g, and the height is 3 meters. Multiplying those things together will get me the gravitational potential energy initially. At the end, the final kinetic energy, 1 half times 20, and the velocity is what we're trying to figure out v squared. Working this out, we have 20 times 9.8 times 3. We have 588 on the left hand side. On the right hand side we have 10 v squared. Divide both sides by 10, we get 58.8 is equal to v squared. And then we've got to square root it and we get 7.6 meters per second would be the unit for a velocity and then we're done number 10 a rubber band is stretched and shot straight up it reaches a height of 2 meters find the spring constant so we're going to use the idea of energy conservation the beginning energy initial is equal to the final energy the initial energy is the stretched rubber band. That's elastic, one-half kx squared. <clears throat> it's shot straight up and it reaches a height of two meters. At the very tippy top, it's at two meters. At the very tippy top, it's not moving. For that one instant, it's stationary. And so therefore, it doesn't have any kinetic energy. The rubber band's not stretched anymore, so it has no elastic. It just has gravitational, mgh. We're trying to find the spring constant, which is k, so that stays a letter. Everything else is going to turn into a number, though. The x is the amount of stretch, which is 0 0.04. On the right-hand side, the mass is 0 0.003. g is 9.8, and the height is 2 meters. So we have two things here in the stripe problem that are a distance. One is a stretch, and one is the height of the trajectory. You've got to be careful about which one goes where. Okay, on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, left-hand side, we have 0 0.04 squared times 0.5, and we get 0 0.0008. And uh, let's see here, we have a K on the left-hand side there. Then we have equals, and then all these things put together. 0 0.003 times 9.8 times 2. 0 0.0588. Divide by that. Let's see, your 16. 0 0.0588 divided by 0 0.0008 equals 73.5. That does not look familiar to me from my morning class, so let me double check my math here. You got the same thing as me? Okay, that, that sounds promising. I like it when I do things right. Okay. Yep, 
Number 11, a spring-powered dart gun has a spring constant of 5. It shoots a dart horizontally. The spring is compressed a little bit when the gun is ready to fire. How fast does the dart fly? The initial energy has got to equal the final energy. The initial is the compressed spring's elastic energy, 1 half kx squared. The final energy is the uh, kinetic energy of the dart flying through the air, 1 half mv squared. We are looking for the velocity v, how fast the dart flies, so the v stays a letter. The m is the mass of the, of the, of the dart, 0 0.03. The 1 half comes down. x is the amount of stretch or compression. It says here 0 0.04 and we got to square that. The K is 5, and then we have the 1 half out front. 0 0.04 squared times 5 times 0.5 equals 0 0.004 on that side. 0 0.03 times 0.5 is 0 0.015. Divide. And then we have to square root. So I get 0.516 is equal to the velocity. That'll be in meters per second. That looks familiar from this morning. Power is the rate of changing energy. And the metric unit of that is watts. The English unit is horsepower. And yes, one horsepower is indeed the power of one horse. Um, they did that with uh, horses lifting up the crates in the coal mines, lifting up crates of coal. Okay, number 15, a tractor pulls a 500-kilogram wagon with a 900-newton force. The wagon speeds up from 1 meter per second to 3 meters per second in 5 seconds. How much power did the tractor exert? So power, as we set up here, is the rate of changing energy. Whenever you see the word rate, it means that you're going to divide something by time. So the change in energy divided by time. The energy that's being changed here is kinetic energy. So we're going to have 1 half mv squared final, the, the last velocity, minus the initial 1 half mv squared. And then we're going to divide all of that by the time. So 1 half, the mass. Now this is going to be the mass of the wagon that's moving. That's 500. The velocity, the final velocity is 3. We've got to square that. Minus the 1 half mv squared for the initial situation, which is going to be 1 meter per second. Divide all that by the time of 5 seconds. So we don't really actually use the 900 newtons of force. That's extraneous information. Multiplying all that together, let's see, 0 0.5 times 500 times 9 minus 1 half times 500 times 1 squared equals 2,000. Divide all that by 5, and I get 400. 400 is the answer up there. Number 16, a child pulls on a rope pulley system to lift a wagon. The rope is 20 meters long. The wagon rises up from 1 to 3 meters in 5 seconds. How much power? Okay, let's go down here. Power, once again, is the change in energy divided by time. The energy that's changing here is gravitational. So it's the mgh final minus mgh initial. Whenever you see a delta... It's always the final thing minus the initial thing. Okay, MGH. Oh, let's see here. The mass is 50. 9.8 for the G. And the H is, 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 is. The final height is 3. Minus the MGH initially. And the initial is 1 meter high. Divide all that by 5 seconds. 50 times 9.8 times 3 minus 5 times 9.8 times 1 equals, divide by 5, 284. Let me double check that and make sure that's all good.
50 times 9.8 times 3 minus 50 times 9.8 equals, divided by 5 equals 196. That looks more familiar to me. 196. Somebody else agree with me with 196? Yeah. Hot diggity dog, somebody else agrees with me. It must be right. 